next uh, speaker, Josh, uh, I think that we already did one or two events in the past, Josh, by the way. So, uh, yeah. But if you are not familiar, Josh has worked as a consultant in IT and application security and risk for 15 years now, as well as a software developer, God forbid. He is currently CTO at Bound Security, where he helps clients improve and get better value from their application security processes and also delivers talks and training around the world. Again, I can testify at least for one uh, such event that I, we had in the past. Josh, mm -hmm. the stage is yours and so does the remote control. Okay, let's see whether I can move it. One second, I do need one second, one second. Maybe I, I will steal it from you for a sec. Okay. And put the spotlight on you. Now to go. All right. So let's just, oh, no, not that way. Let's go this way. There we go. All right. Yep. Hello, everyone. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much to uh, Lior and uh, Giddy for having me today. And uh, yeah, it's been some great talks so far. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about AppSec uh, vulnerability scanners and a little bit more generally, and just sort of pick up some ideas for how to get better value from them, how to Get less headache from them. Um, and I'll talk about exactly what that means in a second. But first of all, a little bit about me. Um, so I think uh, Giddy already gave me quite a good introduction. Uh, the key thing is that I work with lots of different organizations, lots of different development teams, and I see lots of different challenges that they face. Um, and you know, most of the uh, ideas and concepts in this talk come from you know, lessons learned from seeing issues in different environments, what's worked well, what's worked less well. Um, also, in my spare time, I'm very involved with OWASP. Uh, if you're based in Israel, we've got the AppSec IL conference coming up next week. So be sure to ask me about that if you're local, because we'd uh, love to see you there. It's going to be a great uh, conference about application security. Uh, I'm pretty sure our friends from Bright are going to be there as well. Um, I'm also a co-leader of the OWASP ASVS project, but that's not actually what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, again, if you've got questions about ASVS, feel free to uh, ask later on or reach out to me. I'll, I've got contact details there, and I'll put contact details up at the end as well. Um, what do we want to talk about today? What do I want to talk to, about today? So we're talking about these AppSec scanning tools. Okay, we're talking about these different tools, and I'll define exactly the ones I want to talk about in a sec. Um, but you know, these can be great accelerators. You know, as, as Tanya pointed out at the beginning, we can't do things manually. We need tools to automate things for us. We need tools to speed things up for us. There's too much going on to be able to do everything ourselves, you know, manually looking through lists or searching through code. But the tools that we use for this can be quite tricky to understand. Some may be more user friendly than others, and they can end up causing a bit of a headache. And you know, again, not you know, Gadi mentioned moving tools over to developers. Now, I'm not talking specifically, obviously, <laughs> about Bright's tool here. Um, but in general, if you want to move tools to developers, we've got to make sure that we're really on top of you know how's this tool configured? Is it giving the right results? Is it giving the results that make sense? Because the last thing we want to do is just bring them sort of extra headache and sort of make them negative about security because we've gone, oh, look, here's this great tool that you can use for security purposes. And then they look at it and they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And that's a false positive, And I don't understand that. And you know, it's, it's a very sort of quick way of destroying sort of security morale when it comes to developers. So it's important we understand better how to use these tools and sort of what we're, what we're trying to achieve and how to make sure that we get what we need from these tools without getting bogged down in millions and millions of findings. So that's the overall you know, challenge that I see here. Uh, and I see it the clients that I work with. So which tools am I talking about? So I specifically want to talk about three sort of primary tools. There are other types as well, but uh, you know, these are the three types I want to talk about. Um, SCA, Software Composition Analysis. So this is a tool that is looking for vulnerabilities in libraries that we're using. So not our code, someone else's code, someone else's code that we've brought into our application. Um, but it's looking for potential vulnerabilities in those libraries or rather known vulnerabilities in those libraries. Um, and that's happening, you know, I say coding time, as in we can scan code that's before it compiles, before it runs, we can scan the code, scan the libraries and find that. Uh, SAST, Static Application Security Testing. So this is automatically finding vulnerabilities in our code. Um, also should be at coding time, you know, we scan the code, looking at for vulnerabilities in the code that we've written or code in that our developers have written. Um, so rather than SCA, which are looking at libraries, SAST is looking at our own code. And then we have DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, which is looking for vulnerabilities, again, in, in our code, specifically looking for vulnerabilities in our code at runtime. So while the application is running, what vulnerabilities can we find in that application? So some of these um, ideas will be specific for 
certain tools. Some of them will be general to all the tools. But the idea is to go through, through a few quick fire ideas about you know, things that can make our lives easier and ultimately lead to us spending less time and less stress operating and working with these tools. So that's the, uh, the agenda I'll put up, uh, up again at the end. But like I say, three sort of key areas, one around how the tool works, one around how am I using the tool, one around how am I using fixing issues, and I'll talk about a few ideas from each one. So let's, uh, let's dive, dive into it. So how does the tool work? So we sort of hinted about this on and off in the previous talks, but at which point in our sort of development life cycle or the, you know, the life cycle of a piece of code can we actually get a scan? Now, you know, we talk about SAS being a scan very early on. Maybe it's scanning in the IDE. Maybe it's scanning um, uncompilable code. But some SAS scanners need you to be able to compile the code to get a proper scan. Some SAS, SAS scanners, you actually need to have a proper sort of compiled output in order to scan. Uh, if we think about DAST, then you're usually going to have to have some form of running code in order to be able to do that. In order to be able to scan an application dynamically, the application needs to be running. It needs to be able to you know, have that dynamic activity within the application. So it's very important to take into account, well, where am I doing the scan? When am I doing the scan? And you know, which point is it going to give me the value that I actually need? There's no point in saying, well, I'm going to run this SAS scan as soon as developers um, commit lines of code when we actually we can't do that. We have to have compilable code. We have to have compiled already code. We have to have binaries. So it's important to understand when you're looking at the tool, when you're looking either for a new tool or looking at how you're going to work with your existing tool, to make sure you're clear, where is it going to fit into the process? Where is it going to fit into the process? It's actually going to give you the results that are going to be valuable to you. Um, sub point of that is that if you have to compile the code in order to actually scan it, does it need some sort of special treatment? Do you need to keep debug symbols in? Are you going to have to, have to, set, have to set up some sort of parallel pipeline that compiles the code in a special way for your scanner? But you have to have, you know, in parallel to that, the, the main pipeline is actually going to production. So it's important to take into account, you know, what do I actually need in order to perform this scan? Um, usability. You know, we talk a lot about automation. We talk a lot about, okay, we're just going to, you know, press the button, the scan's going to run, and we'll magically get results somewhere else, maybe in a ticketing system or something. The fact is that at some point, someone is going to have to use this tool and have to be able to work with this tool. And if the tool you know, doesn't have a friendly UI, doesn't have a user interface that is conducive to actually understanding how to deal with the tool, how to configure the tool, how to review the findings, you're going to have a difficult time. You know, again, the ultimate sort of end goal is that we can try and make findings flow straight into interfaces which the developers are already familiar with. You know, we run a scan, we're confident enough with the scan, the scan goes and opens up a ticket somewhere in the developer's existing ticketing system, and we don't, uh, you know, they, and they just get it as if there was any other bug. You know, that's the ideal, but we're not going to get that straight away. And it may be that each time you add new rules, new functionality, you know, we need to have some time to actually look through the results that are coming back and, and uh, filter or, or configure the results that are coming back. And that means you need to be able to understand what's actually going on in the tool. So definitely don't overlook this. Don't look at a load of integrations and say, well, I'm not going to worry about what the tool does because I'm just going to integrate it into my existing tools. Make sure that you understand what you're actually seeing on screen. So this is a DAST specific point now, um, but I think it's really important. And again, Gadi sort of talked about this to a certain extent when he was talking about uh, Bright's DAST, but you know, it goes for Bright's DAST, it goes for any DAST. If the DAST is, if you're relying on the DAST tool, being able to navigate the application and find functionality in the application, you run the risk that it might not find everything. You know, there are a lot of DAST scanners that will say, yeah, put in a URL, press the button, and it will scan the application, and you'll get findings back, and everything will be great. Practically speaking, again, I've seen this in the field. Most DAS scanners will require at least some configuration just to get past the login page. Once you've done that, how easy, how easily the DAS scanner is able to navigate the application depends on how easy your application is to navigate. You know, certainly, applications that are very JavaScript heavy have very heavy you know, JavaScript front ends where you know, the front end is being di generated dynamically and it's just talking to APIs in the back end. A lot of DAS scanners will struggle with that. You know, they've had to come up with new ways of navigating the application. So you want to make sure that you've got ways of steering your DAS tool. You know, maybe that's giving it a list of links at the sort of most simple, straightforward um, way. 
But ideally, you want to do something more sophisticated. Maybe there's a browser add-in that the DAS vendor provides that you can browse through the application and then upload that into the DAS, and it knows what to look for. Um, Postman file or Swagger and open API files. If you've got APIs that you want scanned and you want the DAS scanner to know how to actually scan those APIs. Um, maybe a half file that contains you know, full log of requests that were sent to the application. You know, whatever it takes. But ultimately, you need to make sure that you've got a way of actually feeding this into your DAS scanner so it actually knows what it's going to look for. So it knows what to find, knows how to find functionality because whatever it can't find, it can't test the vulnerabilities. And you know, if, you're not, if you're not covering areas of your application, you're not getting the value from the, the scan that you really want. You need to try and keep an eye on well, what coverage am I getting? Try and figure out, well, you know, how much of my application am I covering? Can I get a log out of the scanner saying, well, we covered this section, we covered these endpoints? Because you know, otherwise, how are you going to know what your coverage is? And also bear in mind that this isn't a one-time thing. This isn't, OK, well, here's my application, and I'm going to scan it. I'm going to create a, some sort of request log of my application that shows how to browse the application. I'm going to put it into a DAS scanner. I'm going to do that once, and I'm done. Because that, no, this is a... Uh, this is an ongoing thing. You know, we're, most applications are being developed on an ongoing basis. New features are being added. New functionality is being added. If we don't have a way of telling the desk scanner, okay, well, here's this new functionality, and you know, here's how you find this new functionality, then the desk scanner is basically stuck in the past. It's stuck in this old stage of, of how the application was when you first ran the scan. It's important to be able to get the coverage that you need in order to get findings from the application. So how am I using a tool? How am I actually working with a tool? So something that I've seen a number of times, yeah, everyone likes to talk about metrics, everyone likes to talk about measuring performance. No one really likes doing it. It's sort of a challenging thing to do. And the biggest problem is finding the right metrics. What I've seen often is the people sort of put it off and they'll put it off and put it off. And then they'll discover, well, Someone else decided what the number that they should be tracking should be. Someone else discovered that just decided what number should be reported up to management and should be included in dashboards and be discussed in you know quarterly senior level meetings. Um, and you don't want that to happen. You don't want to be in a situation where someone else has discussed decided what your metric should be, what you should be tracking. So I tend to split metrics into a couple of sides. I think on the one hand, you want to assess the performance of the tool. You want to think about, well, is this tool giving me the value that I want? Is this tool effect working effectively for me? So for SCA specifically, am I getting good quality data from the vendor? Am I getting good specific information about vulnerabilities that's saving me time and saving me effort? You know, if I get a very general report, there is a vulnerability in this library, I'm going to spend a lot of time scratching my head and thinking, well, am I affected? Am I not affected? Am I definitely using this? You know, if I get much more specific information that says there is a vulnerability when you use this function in this specific subversion of the library in this context, and that's going to speed up how long it takes you to get through these vulnerabilities to decide, is this a problem for me? Is this not a problem for me? Um, how long is it taking to perform scans? If you know, we talked earlier on about you know the speed of development versus the speed of security. If security represented by scans is going much slower than development, then you're not going to keep up. You're not going to keep pace with uh, you know, what the developers are doing. Uh, coverage we mentioned for DAS, but it, you know, it goes for other tools as well. Make sure that they're not missing things out. They're not loot. They're not uh, blind to certain things. You know, I've seen examples where an application, you know, they ran a SAS tool over the application, over the application's code base, and half of the code base they couldn't find. They couldn't understand it for some reason. It was written using some sort of framework or some add-on to the, the programming language, and the SAS scanner didn't understand it, so it wasn't scanning it, and it wasn't getting results from it. Um, and accuracy as well. You know how accurate is this scanner? How often am I having to sort of get rid of false positives because it's come up with a load of um, results that aren't actually correct or don't make sense or aren't correct in our context? Um, and ideally, the opposite as well. You know, how often are we discovering, oh, this problem came up in a pen test? Oh, well, why didn't the scanner find that? Oh, we don't know. We don't know why the scanner didn't find that. Um, but if we're seeing that we're running a scanner, but it's not finding things that it should be, that's another indicator that we're not, we've not got the level of accuracy that we expect. Now, different scanners are able to find different things. We have to consider it in that context. Not every scanner can find every vulnerability. But if this is a vulnerability, you know, something straightforward, SQL injection, we'd expect a SAS tool to jump all over that, but we're still getting um, findings like that from our pen testing, we might want to think, you know, is this tool giving me the level of coverage that I need? Also, how are we doing? And I 
I say, well, look, we don't want to go and pull out numbers. We're not going to say, you know, today we've got 10 high risk vulnerabilities. Tomorrow we've got 15 high risk vulnerabilities. Therefore, we're getting worse. You know, we don't want to look at just these raw, meaningless numbers. You think about, you know, numbers in context, numbers that make sense. So let's talk about, you know, how are we doing in our remediation efforts? How are we doing in our fixing efforts compared to how we're supposed to do doing? We're setting ourselves a target or we're checking, are we meeting that target? If we're under that target, do we need more time assigned? If we're over that target, then maybe we need to rethink how we're estimating and we can also be really happy that we're uh, exceeding expectations. But we need to be thinking about numbers in context. Uh, we don't want to be looking at, all. Oh, this is the current number of vulnerabilities. We want to think about, well, these are the ones we've fixed in the current period and these are the new ones that came out in the current period because there's nothing more demoralizing than thinking, well, I haven't moved or we've just moved. The you know, number of vulnerabilities have gone up when in fact we've actually fixed things behind the scenes, but we've also acquired new vulnerabilities. Maybe someone discovered a new vulnerability in the library and we've now... That's now increased our numbers. The other thing to do is look at the findings that are coming out. Look at the, um, you know, the, the very common findings that are coming out and use those to drive training. Say, well, look, we're seeing a lot of findings in this area. We're seeing a lot of SQL injection issues. Or we're seeing um, a lot of SSRF issues. Maybe we need to improve how we're training our developers based on that information. You, know, you take the information that's coming out of the tool and use it to actually drive where do we need to improve? Where do we need to help developers with, and, and support them in actually doing this better to begin with? And uh, finally, issue, issue recurrence. So if we're seeing that a particular issue keeps coming up and coming up again, it might be a training issue. It might be, mean that we need to provide different resources to developers to make it easier for them not to make this mistake, some sort of you know, library that handles some of this complexity so they don't have to worry about it themselves. But using these numbers, using these numbers to actually improve our overall situation. So when we get one of these tools, there are lots of different things you've got to do with the tool. And again, we talked about moving from AppSec to developers, but it's not, it's not just about that. You know, I've seen examples where a new security tool comes in or a new SaaS tool, a new SCA tool. Oh, this is a security tool. This is, this is security's responsibility. This is up to AppSec to deal with it. But you know, there are lots of different things here. You know, who's going to implement this tool in the first place? Who's going to make sure that it runs and it does scans? Um, who's going to review the results that come out of the tool? And who's going to fix the issues? Now, not all of those things are going to be on AppSec or on security people. This needs to be spread around the organization. Not all of it's going to be on developers either. You know, if we need who's going to implement it, it needs to be someone who's very familiar with the tool, familiar with how do we need to deploy this. You know, if it's a cloud solution, maybe that's more straightforward. It's just a question of some access. If it's something that needs to be deployed on premises, then you know, it might be a, a more complicated, um, more complicated undertaking. But that's going to need. You know, first of all, management to be involved, management to buy in, and also potentially someone from IT, someone from operations, someone who's going to be able to make sure that tool put, gets put in the right place in the organization. When it comes to running and maintaining the scans, again, that's not really an AppSec thing. You know, AppSec aren't going to start building DevOps pipelines or automation pipelines and uh, adding the scanning in there. There's usually teams that are dedicated to doing that, and they're going to want to be in control of that process, and you know, they need to be in control, control of that process there the ones who are familiar with it. Now, the configuration, that might be AppSec. AppSec might say, okay, we'll do it like this. But actually putting it into place and maintaining it and making sure that it runs, you need to make sure that gets get that responsibility gets, gets given to the team who handle that sort of automation on a daily basis. Who's going to look at the results? Who's going to review and prioritize the results? Well, here maybe it's more of an AppSec thing, although if AppSec can delegate some of that or if they can train developers or even maybe security, security champions so that they're able to do that themselves, then it's going to take some of the pressure off AppSec and free off AppSec to have more time to work on other things. And finally, fixing, you know, maybe AppSec are very deeply involved in the code base and they're close enough to it that they can start proposing fixes. But again, developers are going to need to be able to do that. And developers are going to need to have time to do that. Developers are going to need to have that as part of their day job, as part of, um, okay, you write code, you fix bugs, and part of bugs is security issues. And that has to be planned in as part of their overall day to day. Can't expect AppSec to you know, wave a magic wand, run a scan, and then fix the issues as well. And okay, well, how do we how do we achieve that? How do we get everyone involved in that? How do we get all these different teams to actually do their part in getting a scanner working? So that comes to management. We can't just go to teams from the side and say, "Oh, can you do us a favor and let's like stick this in in your spare time? You know, get this scanner running in your spare time or add this pipeline." You know, it needs to be made part of their job. Um, you know, there's a trope of security is everyone's job. You know, it's, it's people's jobs are, are what their management, what their team leaders, what their group leaders define for them. That's their job. 
if they've got time allocated to work on this sort of work, to work on fixing vulnerabilities, to work on maintaining the pipelines that actually cause the scans to happen, then that's what they'll do. But if security is sort of running around, coming from the side saying, look, could you get this working? Could you do this? But they're not hearing that from above. They're not hearing that in their work allocations and their sprint planning meetings, wherever else. And it's not going to get done. It's certainly not going to get done um, in a happy way. You know, you're going to end up with people thinking they're being given extra work by security. That security is sort of adding to their workload and they're not uh, getting recognized or appreciated for that by you know, the people who actually appraise their performance and govern their promotions. And that brings us back to metrics. If we want management buy-in, we've got to demonstrate how we're doing, which means we need to have good metrics on how we're progressing. Are we meeting our targets? We need to verify, well, actually, are, you know, are we progressing in the way we're supposed to be doing? Are we fixing vulnerabilities at the rate which we expect to be? Are we fixing vulnerabilities based on our targets that we say we would do? Once we can track that, we can say, well, are we complying? We're not complying. Say, look, to, to management, OK, well, we need to trigger an exception process so we've gone over the amount of time we had to fix this issue or we've not fixed this issue fast enough. And again, by starting off with this management buy and saying, look, this is our plan, it puts us in a much better position to say, well, look, we want to address these issues you know, based on the plan we originally made and that you bought into and you agreed to and you agreed to allocate the time to. So it's the way we make sure you know, we're not suddenly under lots of pressure. Oh, where's all this extra security work come from? Because the security work is part of the day-to-day. -day. It's defined as part of the developer's day-to-day -day work. So the final section here is, uh, you know, how am I going to fix issues? How am I going to address issues that come up from the scan? So I talked about you know, getting developers very stressed because they suddenly have a whole load of extra work to do. Part of that is if we try and run a scanning tool like this, full rule set, everything activated, we're going to get a whole load of findings, some of which are going to be important and a lot of which are not going to be important. We certainly don't want the developer sat there trying to decide that or try and make that decision or trying to figure out, well, what do I need to be worried about here? What do I not want to be worried about here? We don't want to take a, a phased approach for this. We're going to take an approach where we say, look, we're going to gradually start, you know, we're going to start off with the rules we think are the most important, going to give us the most signal compared to the amount of noise, and they're going to be the most valuable to us. And we're going to gradually introduce new rules and new rules. So that you know, I might consider that based on signal to noise ratio. If we know that there are rules that get a lot of noise, a lot of false positives, we probably don't want to start with those. Um, maybe we want to start with the findings that are the highest risk. And that's not just the highest risk based on what the tool says. It might be the highest risk based on our own application, our own organization. You know, what are we most concerned about from an organizational perspective? Are there types of findings that will be particularly dangerous in our organizational context? The other thing is we don't just want to uh, focus on rules that are easy to fix or issues that are going to be easy to fix, because if we keep pushing off the hard to fix ones, it will just push it down the line and down the line, and we'll eventually end up getting to a stage where we've now got a lot of hard to fix issues. We want a blend of things that are going to be easier to fix and hard to fix. So on the one hand, we're maintaining development velocity, and you know people are feeling good because, okay, we had this issue come up on the scanner, but we fixed it, we've moved on, and we're feeling good now. But on the other hand, okay, well, we've got this more difficult issue, it's going to take more code changes, it's going to be a more significant uh, modification. It's going to take some time, but we're going to work through it gradually, and we're going to get it done. We don't want to just keep pushing that sort of thing on pushing that sort of thing off until it becomes a massive, massive problem that we're suddenly pushed into fixing at a time that's not convenient to us. So if we're fixing issues, you know, it's very easy to say, OK, I've got one finding. I'm going to look at this finding. I'm going to figure out what the problem is, and I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to move on. It's going to be a lot more valuable in the long run. You're going to save a lot of time in the long run to spend a little bit more time thinking, what's the root cause of this issue? OK, I've got this scan issue. It's found this particular problem in my code. But you know, why is that happening? And could it be happening anywhere else? You know, I worked with an organization where this, they ran a SaaS tool, and it came back with, I think, 1,000 log injection findings or something. Um, and they're like, well, well, you know, what are you going to do about this? And then they came back the next day, and it came back with one log injection finding. And I went to them and I said, well, what, what happened here? What, what changed? What uh, difference did you make? And I'm like, oh, yeah, we, they, they were very happy with themselves. They thought, oh, yeah, we, we tricked the tool. We tricked the tool into uh, only having one finding instead of 1,000 findings because we took all these different log injection findings and we took all the logging code and we put it all into one place and we created the wrapper class and we used the wrapper class everywhere instead of using the original log injection, instead of using the original logging class. 
And now the scanner tool just sees one instance of logging, flags up on that, and everywhere else it just sees the wrapper class. And they, they were really excited. They thought they tripped the tool into like getting rid of a load of findings. I said, no, no, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You put it all in one place, you deal with this issue across the entire code base, you wrap up that class, you have one place where you're doing logging, and then you perform the sanitization, you perform the uh, fix in order to make sure that you're not vulnerable to that issue and you have to do it in one place and maintain it in one place. So rather than thinking, well, how do I fix this in one place? How do I move on? How do I fix this in the next place? You know, think about how am I going to fix this across the, all, all the uh, entire application? Anyway, that might be centralizing in a particular place. That might be taking a piece of insecure functionality, replacing it something else. You know, if we see, okay, we've got SQL injection because we're using database text queries, can we replace those with, say, a uh, object relational model, which is a different way of working with a database that tends to be safer, less exposed to this sort of issue? Yes, it's going to be some upfront effort, but it may well eliminate this entire class of vulnerability for our application. You know, if we're struggling a lot with authentication authorization, can we use some sort of external component to handle that? And then only have to worry about the external component. If we're constantly struggling with secrets, can we create some sort of centralized secret management me uh, mechanism for the application? And again, we've fixed that once and once and for all, and we don't have to worry about it on the rest of the application. So that's the ideal to say, look, we're going to spend a little bit more time early on to save a lot of time in the long run, save a lot of you know, repeat issues and repeat hassle. We have to go back and fix the next one, fix the next one, fix the next one. Um, and this is something to go away and think about. Um, often you might find an issue, and it's more of a SaaS thing, but uh, you might find that a particular issue doesn't look exploitable. And the developers are saying, well, it's not exploitable because of some weird other reason. You know, it's not exploitable because it gets cast into a numeric. You know, it's a, you can't get text through it, you can only get numbers. Um, it's not exploitable because it's got a very low minimum length or some data goes into an array and out of array. You know, there's a reason why it's not exploitable. Okay? If you try and scan this with DAST, it won't be exploitable. But the SAS scanner thinks maybe it is because it's not being done safely. It's very easy to say, well, it's not exploitable, so we're not going to deal with it. Or we're going to ignore it even worse. The problem here is that if we're, it's not exploitable because of some other sort of unintentional reason, the risk is that further down the line, someone will change that functionality and suddenly it will become exploitable. Someone might decide, well, today that's got a minimum length of five, and tomorrow it's got a minimum length of 100. And now you can get a payload into that length. You can fit a pay dangerous payload in there, and it will be exploitable. But you already, you know, two months ago, say, oh, no, that's not, a big, that's not an issue because it's not exploitable right now. I'm going to ignore it, and I'll never see it again on my SAS tool. So you don't want to just ignore these things. You don't want to just make these things go away because if the code changes, you have run a significant risk that you might become vulnerable to it. So don't just go saying, well, it's not exploitable today, so I'm going to ignore it, unless you know you've got a way of discovering if it's exploitable tomorrow. Let's see, it looks like I'm coming towards the end of time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So uh, I can see Giddy's hurrying me up, because he's moving on to the next slide already. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, very quickly, I have one more question. Uh, one, uh, only one question to ask, because again, we are running out of time, and now is uh, waiting patiently to, to speak as well. <laughs> Sorry, no. Um, Earlier before, you mentioned it, Gadi mentioned it, uh, even Tanya mentioned it, training, training, training. How much training is enough? Or is there something like training is way too much from your experience? I mean, secure coding training, of course, not awareness in general. Okay. The number one thing I'd say about secure coding training is you want it to be interactive. You want it to be um, something developers are familiar with, they want to be doing an interface they're familiar with, they want to be doing it to be hands-on. It needs to be something that they really feel like, okay, you know, I understand this, I recognize this, I, you know, I'm familiar with this, and I'm actually interacting with it and engaged with it. You know, the worst case scenario is if you show developers a whole load of slides that are generic and just sort of aren't related to them, I, I don't think it's going to benefit anything. I think the important thing is there is that interactivity, and they have the chance to actually try things out and try out vulnerabilities and try out fixing the vulnerabilities. And you know, there are plenty of platforms that will allow that sort of thing. Um, because the best case scenario is you then, you then find developers who are really excited by this sort of thing and you know, really want to do this sort of thing. And then you're like, oh, I've now found my new security champions. You know, I found the people who actually want to do, do security stuff. And they can then help you in that role and you know, act as a force multiplier for you. So I think the important thing is that the training is engaging and interactive and that you know, they, they feel like they're going to be excited to do it. Um, but also they've got the time to do it. They need, again, that's another thing that's come down from above saying, look, 
this is part of your job. Part of your job is to go through this training. You're having time allocated to go through it. It's not just something we're expecting you to do in your free time, fitting in between other things. Great. Thank you for that one. Um, thank you, Josh. And again, if there will be time for more questions later on, we'll uh, go through them or we can always send them to you uh, later on.